Welcome to Christian Faith Ministries, where Drs. Greg and Deidre Thomas are the pastors. As we embrace the future together with so many uncertainties, we are here to help you survive and thrive during this pandemic and beyond. Join us today as we declare war on poverty and sickness. Well, praise God, I'm Dr. Greg Thomas, and I am so excited, praise God, for this series that I've been teaching on how to deal with affliction, or some people call it suffering. I want you to understand, praise God, suffering is a fruit of the Spirit, and praise God, when you understand that, you will begin to understand and get a revelation of that is necessary. <laughs> You'll get to the place where you are shake hands with Mr. or Mrs. Suffering, because it, it brings you to another place in life. It gives you a greater revelation of who God is and helps you to get through some of those real tough places that you've been struggling with. So it's necessary. Now, when you're going through it, you don't always feel that way. But after, at the end of it, or when you get to the other side of it, you're saying, wow, it was beneficial that I suffered. Oh, praise God. I uh, pray you've been blessed by this series. And today we're going to talk about a biblical character that a lot of us don't know a lot about, and some of us do. And it's, uh, the character, is, his name is Job. Now, when I was growing up, and praise God, when I first got introduced to the Bible, and I started studying the different uh, books of the Bible, I, I kind of avoided this particular one because it was a book called Job. It's spelled with J-O-B. And at that particular time, I felt that it would tell me about getting a job. I was a little kid and I enjoyed working, but it was just, I'm just being facetious and trying to be, you know, uh, a comedian <laughs> talking about it. But praise God, so many of us, you know, we didn't know it was Job and we would call it Job, but praise God. But I want to talk about Job today and not Job. I want to talk about Job's secrets to overcoming what I call blindside affliction. A blindside affliction is when something shows up in your life and you're being afflicted and you didn't expect it. You're doing everything right. You're doing everything that you know to do according to the word of God. Oh my goodness. And then all of a sudden here comes this affliction and you're suffering and you're going through something and everybody else around you, it seems like they're full of joy and they got all, everything is working for them. And you're wondering why me, Lord? Why am I going through this? I think I'm talking to somebody right now. I pray that through this message that you'll get a revelation the way Job got a revelation. He didn't start off that way, but as he went through, praise God, God delivered him as he got a greater revelation. Oh, praise God. You know, now when we talk about Job, you know, Job had been, we come on the scene when he had been laying in his own misery, you know, for for several months, and, and the Bible said he had open sores all over his body. Uh, it lets us also see that during this time that he bore the grief of seven dead sons and three dead daughters. And if that wasn't enough, all of his wealth had vanished away in one afternoon. The Bible says that Job had become repulsive to his wife and repulsive to his friends and even to the little children. They despise him as he lay on the ash heap outside of town while he suffered. Now, you know, one of the things that we began to see that Job had an unwavering faith, but he went to a season where his faith even began to waver. And, and um, praise God, and at first Job bore these calamities with amazing submission, as we see in Job 1, 21, when Job said to his wife, the Lord gave and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of of the Lord. Shall we receive good at the hand of the Lord, and shall we not receive evil? You see, in Job's statement to his wife about his unwavering faith of love for God, it also shows that even though it appears as though Job had unwavering faith, it also shows us that he was human, just like you and I. He made the statement without a true revelation of who 
and whom God is and, 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 and in the midst of suffering. You see, Job had not gone through this time, this kind of suffering before. We must understand that Job, praise God, he had never been tempted uh, like this before. His faith had never been challenged like this before. Just like you and I, he's, you know, our faith will always grow uh, to new heights and increase in revelations through suffering. But when we're going through something that we never experienced, we might act just like Job behaved. See, as Job's suffering and affliction drugged out over the months, and we began to see how Job wavered in his confidence that God was for him. As we examine Job's statement, we can see, first of all, that uh, his revelation of the ways of God was incorrect. Why do I say that? It because he was speaking out of his flesh. When was the last time you were being afflicted and instead of you speaking words of faith, you began to speak out of your soul, out of your mind, your will, your intellect, and your emotions that is untamed and you begin to say things that you know it's not true, but your emotions played a role in it. it you, it's called the flesh. Oh my God, whenever you don't speak the words of faith, you're moving in the flesh uh, while you're going through suffering, just like a lot of people today who speak out of their understanding or their uh, revelation or the traditions of men. Now, in defending himself against the bad theology of his three friends, uh, and, and I'll call his, their names, uh, Elippus, uh, Bildad, and Zafar, uh, Job said some things about God and that, that kind of reveals you know, how uh, he had not grown in a revelation of who God was in the midst of suffering. He began to insist on his own righteousness, which is self-righteousness, at the expense of God's judgment or God's justice. Uh, for an example, in Job 13, 23, 24, he said, make me know my transgressor and my sin. Why do thou hide thy face and count me as an enemy? You see, Job was saying, God, you know, you, you, you looking at my, you, you looking at my transgression, looking at my sin, and now you hide your face from me, and, and you count me as an enemy. You treat me like I'm an enemy, not as a child of God. Job could only think that God was ignoring his faithfulness, and, 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 and that he was treating him like an enemy. And listen, God is not your enemy. I'm talking to someone right now. God is not your enemy. God is your father. God is your father who happens to be the God of the universe, who loves you. Praise God. Hallelujah. See, Job did reach the point where he confessed in Job 19, 25 to 27, that after death, he would see God as his redeemer. But for now, God was treating him as an enemy, not a friend or a child. So Job thought, Hallelujah. And so he complained to God out of his flesh, out of his pain, out of his blind side affliction. Job 23, 3 and 4 and Job 24 and 1 and Job 13, 23 uh, through 24 says, Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. He said he would plead his case like an attorney. Hallelujah. Why? And, and they're looking at God as the great judge. So why are not times of judgment kept by the Almighty? And why do these those who know him never see his days? You see, Job's three friends had taken the position that the sovereignties of Job's suffering must must be the result of some grievous sin that Job had participated in. Now, just like a lot of your friends, they probably see your suffering and they're so quick to say, you know, he, he ain't nothing but a low down sinner, you know, and they begin to point out your weakness and your, your things that they, they know, they think they know about you. Hallelujah. But see, God is seeing it all. He sees what your friends are saying. And he's saying to you today, don't you listen to them. You know, praise God. Hallelujah. 
hallelujah, you know where you are and God sees everything and God know you. He calls you by his name. You know, every grain on the top of your head, hallelujah. Oh my God. See the righteous often suffer more than the wicked and the wicked often prospers more than the righteous. Job is victorious over the superficial theology of his friends. This is how they thought. So he, re so, so I love it because in chapter, uh, Job chapters 32 to 37, we see how this younger brother, his one younger friend, praise God, by the name is Elihu. And, and, and out of his anger, Elihu, his anger rebukes both Job and his three friends. Now, the three friends of Job had not been able to account for the suffering of this good man with their theology, and Job had said rash, had said rash and presumptuous things about God in order to justify his himself. But here comes this young brother by the name of Elihu, a friend of Job, and he spoke up with greater wisdom than Job and his three friends. This lets us know, praise God, that God has no respect to a person. If you're committed to God, God will praise God and you, God will give you the wisdom of the ages. Hallelujah. He'll give you the revelation. You may be going through a whole lot and you've gone through a lot as a young brother, young sister, I come to tell you, God wants to bestow this wisdom in you. Praise God like he did, praise God, in Elihu. In Job 32, the Bible says, so these three men stopped answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. But but Elihu, son of Barak, and the Buzzite of the family of Ram became very angry with Job for justifying himself rather than God. Oh my God. See, sometimes we try to defend ourselves and with people that don't know you. Stop listening to people that don't know you. And if they don't know you, they don't know the things of God and how God is dealing with you. It's called a personal relationship with your father called God. Hallelujah. He was also angry with the three friends. And the Bible says, for, because they had found no way to refute Job and they had condemned him. Now look at verse four uh, in Job 32. It says, now Elihu, Elihu had waited before speaking to Job because they were older, uh, uh, they were older than he. But when he saw that the three men had nothing more to say, his anger was aroused. So Elihu, son of Barakel, and the Buzzite said, I am young in years and you are old. That is why I was fearful. Not daring uh, to tell you what I know, I thought age should speak. Advanced years should teach wisdom, but it is the spirit in a person, the breath of the Almighty that gives them understanding. It is not only the old who are wise, not only the age who understand what is right. Therefore, I say, listen to me. I too will tell you what I know. I waited while you spoke. I listened to your reasoning while you were searching for words. I gave you my full attention, but not one of you has proved Job wrong. None of you has answered his arguments. Do not say we have found wisdom. Let God, not a man, refute him. But Job has not marshaled his words against me, and I will not answer him with your arguments. They are dismayed and have no more to say. Words have failed them. And m must I wait now that they are silent, now that they stand there uh, with no reply? I too will have my say. I too will tell what I know, for I am full of words and the spirit within me compels me. Inside, I am like a bottle bottled up wine, like new wine skins ready to burst. Oh my God, he's talking about that revelation knowledge. I must speak and find relief. I must open my lips and reply. I will show no partiality, nor will I flatter anyone. For if I were skilled in flattery, my maker would soon make me take me away. 
You see, God originally allowed Job's suffering to commence in order to show Satan and the armies of heaven that Job cherished the worth of God more than his possessions and his family and his health. But after Job showed that he did, in fact, love God more than all else in the world, there was another purpose that God sought to achieve by letting his suffering drag on for several months. Here it is. The purpose, according to Elihu, was to purge. And this is for somebody listening to me right now because you're in that same place. This Here it is. The purpose, according to Elihu, this young man, this wisdom that God bestowed on this young man, the revelation was to purge out Job's life as a residue of pride and self-righteousness that had laid quietly in the deep and dark crevices of the heart and soul that came forth in the personality of Job. <laughs> so when Job was shaken by suffering oh, and the affliction that came from the blind side long enough, the sediments of pride was stirred up. The sediments of right of righteousness was stirred up into his life and showed itself when Job tried to justify himself as God's at God's expense. Oh my God, my brothers and sisters, in this lesson about Job and suffering, we learn that there is a twofold purpose for suffering when it comes. It, from the blind side, or even when you don't, when you know it's coming. Oh my God. So what we have seen so far then is that Job's suffering was a twofold explanation. Its purpose at the outset was to demonstrate, here it is, write this down, God's value and glory. And its ongoing purpose was to refine Job's righteousness. His suffering is not punishment. Uh, I come to tell you today that the suffering that you're going through is not a punishment because God don't love you. Oh my God, that is something that I had to learn as a little boy because I went through a period in my life, praise God, my dad has gone on to be with the Lord and he was raised in a home where his father abused him a lot by beating him and, and praise God, I mean, treated him like sometimes like a Hebrew slave, the way he would just beat him unmercifully and some of the other things that he did to my father. So me being the oldest male, the oldest son, I was like his guinea pig of learning how to be a father and learning how to love a son. And his only thing that he knew was to beat me. And praise God, I got to the place where, praise God, when it came down to understanding the things of God, I didn't have the revelation I have today of the love and the grace and the mercy of God. Oh my God, I had I saw God as this angry man with a belly club ready to pounce on me and beat me unmerciful because of whatever I did wrong, that I felt that I could never do anything right. I could often hear the voice, even in my adult age, I can hear the voices of my father, even today, saying, I'm going to beat you till the cows come home. And he would take my clothes, make me take my clothes off, and he would... He would somehow tie me between his legs. He would take this big cow hard belt and he would beat me. And I would, I mean, I, I sweat, praise God, like a pig. And I would get away and that belt would find me wherever I got or ran. And it would hit me. And I remember days that me and my my brother that is next to me, we would be sitting in a corner looking at the whips uh, that how he beat us unmercifully. Those things had an impact on, on me emotionally, and I know it had an impact on my brother. Now, my other brothers and sisters, <laughs> they listen to this, they have no idea because we were the guinea pigs, <laughs> and we can laugh about it because we took it so that they didn't have to go through it. My dad did learn how that beating the hell out of you didn't necessarily guarantee that you'll be a good child, but that's all he knew. And when he got older, we were together, praise God, and I was a grown man, and we were talking. I was take, and just brought him from getting insulin and we're sitting at his at his dinner table and I asked him dad did you have to beat me we was talking about life and he was so happy of all that I accomplished and being a father uh, a, a husband praise God a pastor businessman and had achieved quite a bit and he was just proud you know like any father would 
And I said, well, Dad, you know, growing up, did you have to beat me? So you know what he said? He said, well, you know what? He said, uh, you didn't turn out too bad, did you? <laughs> and he smiled. So I realized he didn't have the revelation, praise God, that I had and that it gave me. So I never had to do that to my boys or my daughter. Amen. But I'm telling you, amen. So, so what we've seen so far about Job is that Job's suffering was a twofold explanation. Its purpose at the onset was to demonstrate God's value and glory, and its ongoing purpose was to refine Job's righteousness. His suffering is not a punishment, and that's the revelation I got. It's not a sign of God's anger. See, because of my dad, how he treated me, I always felt that everything I did, praise God, that God was angry at me, and that God was going to beat me with that billy club, and 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 that sin, and when I was sin, no matter what, if I did something wrong or right, I didn't know what sin was because it didn't have no demarcations. I just got beaten all the time. Oh, you hear me? And so the removal of the, so, so Joel's pain is not the pain of the executioner's whip, <laughs> but the pain of the surgeon's scalpel. What are you saying, Dr. Greg? Here it is. It was the removal of the disease of pride and self-righteousness, praise God, in Job's life. Oh, my God. I pray. Glory to God. I got to end it here. And we're going to pick it up. I'm going to do this in three parts about Job's blind side, seekers of Job's blind pride uh, suffering. Now, praise God, always affliction. I pray that you're getting something out of this. Amen. I got to go because of time. But until next time, remember that the spirit of greatness is upon you. The seed of greatness lives within you. God's got great things in store for you, even in the midst of what you're going through now. If you can hold on to get to the other side, you're going to be able to shake hands with suffering. You say, thank you, Mr. Suffering, because without you, I would not be the person that I am today. This is Dr. Greg Thomas saying, God loves you, and so do I. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to Christian Faith Ministries broadcast, where doctors Greg and Deidre Thomas are the pastors. If you've been blessed and desire to give, you need prayer, or simply want more information about upcoming events or training, go to cfmnola.org. Welcome to the IMLACA Basic Boot Camp. You may be asking the question, what does IMLACA stand for? IMLACA is the abbreviation for International Marketplace Leaders and Chaplaincy Academy. The purpose of launching IMLACA is because the world as we've known it is changing rapidly daily. When the coronavirus pandemic hit in 2019, the entire world shifted from an industrial way of doing things in the marketplace to a digital way. However, one thing that has not changed and will never change is people are suffering and the need for marketplace ministry leaders in business, government, and the church that are equipped, trained, and released as ordained men and women of God as chaplains around the world. This academy was created with you in mind. Yes, you. You've always wanted to be used by God, to be a servant leader in the marketplace, to pray for the sick, perform weddings, christenings, officiate over funerals, and much more. I believe our God has handpicked you for the IMLACA. This course is online, open book, self-paced, self-study, and self-test. Upon completion, you will participate and receive the following. One, Certificate of Completion. Two, You'll participate in an online or in-person ordination and graduation ceremony. By that time, you'll receive your ordination and graduation certificates, signet ring, chaplaincy badge, and lapel pin, digitally or by express mail.